Good morning, and uh, thank you for making it so early in the morning. It always amazes me, the enthusiasm when we have these early morning symposia. Uh, this morning's topic, which is uh, dear to my heart and my colleagues' hearts as well, is titled Expert Guided Strategies to Improve Recognition, Diagnosis, and Treatment of Pulmonary Hypertension Associated with Interstitial Lung Disease. I'm Dr. Stephen Nathan. I'm the Medical Director of the Advanced Lung Disease and Lung Transplant Program at Anova Fairfax Hospital. And it's a privilege to be accompanied by my two esteemed colleagues, colleagues Jean Elwing, who's a Professor of Medicine and Director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Program at the University of Cincinnati, and Juana Preston, Associate Professor of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. And I'm sure everyone sped read our disclosures. So these are our learning objectives and completion of this activity. Uh, partici participants should be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of pulmonary hypertension associated with ILD, talk a little bit about mild or borderline pulmonary hypertension in the context of ILD. Um, there will be a little bit of safety and efficacy data of, about therapy. Actually, we don't get into therapy too much. Discuss strategies to implement recent progress and the learning objectives are here. You can read them all. And I will start out. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, that's me. Introduction and Burden of Pulmonary Hypertension Associated with ILD. So this is the definition, the current definition of pulmonary hypertension. As most people know, we've kind of lowered the threshold and now pH is defined by a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. Whenever you diagnose pH, it always has to be on by right heart cath. And it's especially debilitating in the context of interstitial lung disease, as you'll hear about. Uh, when you have pH complicating ILD, it is associated with numerous deleterious downstream consequences, including reduced exercise capacity, more greater need for supplemental oxygen, worse quality of life, and certainly a worse prognosis. Although one thing you'll hear, and I'll make the point now, is you don't have to be on oxygen to have pulmonary hypertension. Um, there's about 30% of patients who will have underlying pH and are not yet on supplemental oxygen, so don't wait for that. This gives a, um, a perspective on the change in the definition that recently took place between the last World Symposium in 2018, that was the sixth World Symposium, and the 2024 uh, World Symposium that was just held in July of this year. So at the sixth symposium, the threshold for pulmonary hypertension was lowered to greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. The wedge has always been around the same. For precapillary pulmonary hypertension, it has to be less than or equal to 15. In 2018, we said that the PVR had to be at three units or above to qualify as pulmonary hypertension. And then at the 2014 World Symposium, everything stayed the same, except the PVR threshold was lowered to greater than two. So our current definition is the one that's showing for me to the right. I think it's to your right as well. And that's our current definition of pulmonary hypertension, precapillary pulmonary hypertension. This is also from the World Symposium. This was just published in the European Respiratory Journal a month or two ago. And it's a very nice cartoon depiction of and encompasses a lot of what we talk about and have to deal with in the context of group three pulmonary hypertension. From the old definition, uh, for, from the old task force, what we did is we categorized group three by physiology, restrictive, obstructive, combined, restrictive, obstructive. And one of the changes that was implemented by the Seventh World Symposium was to do it by disease category. So you can see the main diseases there, ILD, CPFE, combined pulmonary fibrosis, emphysema, COPD, other chronic lung diseases, and de developmental. And so now we're doing it more based on disease rather than physiology. So what is the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension associated with interstitial lung disease? Most of the data comes from the prototypical ILD, and that's IPF. The numbers up there represent a, a wide range of prevalence, so around 14% for patients with mild to moderate disease, up to 86% at the time of transplant in IPF. And there have been a couple of case series of these other disease entities, so you can see NSIP 31%, CPFE 30 to 50%, chronic HP 20 to 52 
the broad group of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia is just under 30 percent and another estimate three to 64 percent so it really depends when you look for it in terms of how long the patients had their disease for and disease severity as well as the definition many of these estimates came from the old definition of pulmonary hypertension which previously prior to 2018 was an MPAP of greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. What we do know as well is it has tremendous ramifications for patients, but it's also a burden on healthcare resource utilization. As you can well imagine, uh, these patients, more of them are hospitalized, more of them end up in the ICU, and to the healthcare systems, it does end up being more of a financial burden. And I think this goes to the, the notion of earlier detection and er, the earlier we can treat and address pulmonary hypertension in the context of ILD, the better for everyone. So the key takeaways of this brief introduction is that the prevalence of PHILD has been probably underestimated by previous studies. And as you'll hear, it kind of lurks in the background in terms of ILD. When is the shortness of breath due to worsening ILD? versus intercurrent and, super, and superimposed pulmonary hypertension. I mentioned we lowered the threshold to define pulmonary hypertension, and then the last bullet point is given the morbidity, mortality, and healthcare burden associated with pH, it is crucial to improve screening and diagnosis of pH in the context of ILD, and that's what you're gonna be hearing more about. So it gives me great pleasure to call on Jean. Dr. Elwing to talk about the early recognition of pH among patients with ILD. Jean. Well, thank you so much for being here early in the morning to talk about early recognition. So I'm going to ask you all a question before oh. I get started. <laughs> How soon after you meet an ILD patient do you think about pulmonary hypertension? Honestly, I think about it right away. Um, and I might not mention it, uh, but I think it is important to think about it right away. Uh, you know, a lot of times we get fooled. We think this patient definitely has pulmonary hypertension or this patient definitely doesn't. And then for whatever reason, you get a right heart cath and sure enough, they have pulmonary hypertension. And being at a transplant center, we have a low threshold for doing a right heart cath because that's part of the workup. And it constantly surprises me when I'm wrong in terms of guessing either way. So I think it, about it right out of the gate. Okay, great. Awana? Yeah. <clears throat> so I can give you my example as a non-transplant center because I refer patients to, um, into town for a uh, transplant evaluation. And I still think about uh, pH in, uh, in ILD patients uh, because it impacts them. Uh, you can see that once they have overt pH, I think it's, it's, it, it's so impactful uh, n negatively in their lives um, that you think, why didn't I think about it earlier, you know? So, yeah. So. What about you, Jean? I'm the same. I think about it from the day I meet these individuals, but I'm meeting them because they're coming to me for an evaluation. So I think sometimes I have a different perspective than somebody who's seeing ILD for an ILD evaluation. I think you, uh, <laughs> we're going tangential already, yeah. but I think this is important. I think when there is an intervention you can offer patients, mm -hmm. that what's, that's what makes you think about it as early as possible. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about what data we have on this topic. So pathogenesis of PHILD. If you think back, turn back time about a decade, we thought pulmonary hypertension was directly related to ILD, and as ILD progressed, it cause the pulmonary hypertension. However, no clear correlation exists between the degree of restriction and fibrosis and the development of pulmonary hypertension. So I'd like to ask you to think about it a little bit differently. It's a complex interplay of both diseases and one's playing on the other. With tissue destruction, inflammation, fibrosis, hypoxia, leading to changes in the blood vessels in the lungs, and also those processes changing the pulmonary fibrosis. So some interplay that's creating worsening disease. And there's a high coincidence of pH and ILD that could be explained by this 
thought process of a shared pathophysiology. And it's not just one point in time. When Dr. Nathan sees a patient looking at that patient for transplant, he might do a right heart cath. And the mean pressure may be 20. But that doesn't mean it's the end of the story. Because in two, three years from now, the patient could have a mean pressure of 40. So these are disease processes we're watching, both the ILD and the pulmonary hypertension. The ILD, we're checking CTs, and we're checking pulmonary function testing, and we're treating. And the pulmonary hypertension, we're watching for changes that would make us think that this disease is progressing and it needs attention. And none of us are smart enough to be able to say, click, I'm ready to evaluate this patient because they clearly have pulmonary hypertension. Because the patient is progressing with their ILD, they're getting more dysmic, they're fatigued, and then they start having additional symptoms. Is that because of hypoxia or is it because they're developing a pulmonary vasculopathy? And I think we just have to have our minds open to the possibility that this is developing because it does, as Iwana said, changes the outcome for these folks. So what I want you to take away from this initial discussion is that these are two entities that have a shared pathophysiology. It's not just a result of end-stage ILD. Pulmonary vasculopathy and PHILD should be considered a continuum. Both are working together and moving along in the same direction, which many times is negatively. The significant overlap between the two pose a challenge because sometimes we miss it and we have to keep our clinical index of suspicion high so we can detect, diagnose, and potentially treat. So because there's no clear sign, not a simple thing that tells us, we have to rely a lot on our clinical judgment. And recently, Frank Rigaghi and colleagues did a Delphi analysis where you ask questions over and over again till you get a consensus. It's a process, it's very detailed, um, and a lot of work for these experts that collaborate to do this. What they found based on their knowledge, their experience, and current data is there was a consensus that triggers to think about pulmonary hypertension should include PFT parameters with DLCO that has declined more than 15% or a total DLCO of less than 40%, worsening FBC DLCO ratio, and that percentage of FVC to DLCO of greater than 1.6. So those were the PFT parameters they felt were associated with the development of pulmonary hypertension. And they also noted on CT scans, the thing that should trigger thoughts of pulmonary hypertension, RV enlargement, PA enlargement, and that ratio of the PA to the aorta of greater than one. And interestingly, they thought any time you needed supplemental oxygen, you have to think about pulmonary hypertension. So just chew on that for a second. That's a lot of our ILD patients. Or desaturation that is felt to be out of proportion to their ILD. Worsening desaturation or decreased walk distance. Not everybody gets a BNP or nt in BNP, but if you do have that available to you, if they're elevated, that would also be a trigger to think about pulmonary hypertension. So how do you use that in clinical practice? Well, they created an algorithm, expert opinion, on how to approach the ILD patient. You do what you guys do best. You see the patient, you evaluate them, and you look for signs and symptoms of pulmonary hypertension. So things we talked about, worsening overall status in terms of symptoms. And on signs, maybe an accentuated P2, a tricuspid murmur, or signs of right heart failure. By the way, we don't want to wait that long, but if we see that, we definitely need to think about pH. And then you go through those things we discussed and see if the patient is meeting any of those criteria. And then we add that to an echocardiogram. Echocardiograms are not perfect in this population, but they're the easiest and the least invasive way to assess patients. So if that echocardiogram is high risk, it has high risk features for pulmonary hypertension, we're gonna go straight to a right heart cath. But if you're somewhere in between, 
you're going to add your clinical suspicion, your testing, and then use those things together to determine when you're going to do the right heart cath. Because as Dr. Nathan said, sometimes you think somebody has pulmonary hypertension and they don't and vice versa. So if you can use all of the information you have on your patient, you can drive this in the correct direction. So the key takeaways are early screening to identify patients with PHILD may benefit patients by prompting early treatment and importantly, transplant evaluation in high risk patients. These routine clinical evaluations you are already doing and your exam and your history can be used together to try to help you know when to trigger that right heart catheterization or a referral to an expert to do that for you. If suspicious findings are present, you wanna look at your echocardiogram and maybe do an NT pro BNP or BNP and use that information to help guide you and talk to the patient about doing further testing, which includes a right heart catheterization. And we have to have the right heart catheterization to confirm the presence of pulmonary hypertension.